The entities continued to move towards the saucer. The patrol dog then attacked one of the entities. As the entity was attacked, he pointed something at the dog, which caused the dog to immediately run away. One of the SPs pulled out his 38 caliber and fired several rounds at the entities. Today's presentation is about an incident that happened at McCord Air Force Base, which is located near Tacoma, Washington. This incident happened in 1972. One of my supervisors, who I worked with at Area 51, was the investigating OS agent for this case. I'm gonna talk about a tactical air navigation system, or TACAN. All US Air Force bases maintain a TACAN. On October 14, 1972, two Air Force TACAN technicians drove to the TACAN facility for routine maintenance. The facility was a dirt road well maintained by the U.S. Air Force road crews. Upon arrival at the TACAN facility, both technicians opened a gate leading into the TACAN. While inside, both technicians heard a strange sound coming from the outside. One of the technicians went outside to determine the noise that they were hearing. He saw a large flying saucer. When I talk about these incidents, I'm using their words, the witnesses' words, not something that is official. The technician reports and later described this incident and described what he saw as a large flying saucer hovering just above the TACAN building. The technician yelled for his partner to come out and look up. The second technician exited the TACAN building, went outside, looked up, and saw the same thing, which he described as a very large flying saucer. Both technicians observed the saucer-shaped craft land directly in front of the building. Now, directly in front of the building is a clearing. Although this is in a forested area, there's a large clearing inside the fenced area to the, which would have been to the east, or excuse me, to the west of the TACAN building. One of the technicians went back into the building and called the base police. There was a phone located in the building. He called the base police to report this incident. Now, you have to stop and, and, and think about this. He picks up a phone. He dials a certain number. They didn't have 911s back then. Uh, on the base, it was triple five. Triple five got you emergency dispatch. An emergency dispatch contained the base police, the fire dispatch, and the ambulance dispatch. He told the dispatcher who answered the phone that a flying saucer had landed where, they, where he was located and that they needed some help. He also observed two entities wearing silver suits, bright gold colored helmets, exit the craft. Now, he's inside the building with the phone describing what he's seeing on the outside. He's giving uh, real-time information to the dispatcher at the base police office. Now, obviously, this technician on the phone and the other technician that was standing near the phone were startled by what they were seeing. They were seeing a UFO land, or a flying saucer, and two entities, as they call them, exit the craft, and they walked towards the technicians. As the one technician was describing in real time what was happening, he was startled, he said, I'm startled, hold on a minute, and then he came back just a few seconds later and said, they're walking into the building. Now, these two technicians are close together at the entrance to this building. It has a regular door uh, leading from the outside into the TACAN building. These two entities walked past the two technicians 
into the building. Now, the strange part about this is that the technicians, although they're, one of them was on the phone and the other one was standing in close proximity to his, his partner, they feared that they would be harmed if they moved. So they never moved, but somehow these two entities got through them. They walked through them. They got through them in some way. That's how the two technicians described it. They, they, got by, they walked by us. There wasn't enough room for them, for anybody to walk past them. It's a regular door. Uh, and so, and both technicians were in the doorway. How did these two entities get by them? That puzzled a lot of people. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the explanation of this uh, later. The entities walked into the building. One of the technicians turned around and watched them. Now the build, building is, was about 12 foot by 16 foot. It wasn't a big building. And it also contained racks of electronic equipment. The TACN equipment was in there. Plus the radio equipment was also in there. The radio repeater system was also in this building. So it wasn't a lot of area to move around. The only thing other than that in this building was a small desk with a chair that the technicians could record in their log of what they did. One chair. One of the technicians watched these two entities move around the building, looking at the equipment, not damaging it, just kind of walking by and viewing it. And then the two entities exited the building and walked to the rear of the TACAN building. They, they came out and walked around to the back of the building. The two technicians moved into the building and locked the door from the inside. They realized their safest place was inside the building. They could lock it from the inside uh, and they had a telephone and they had limited supplies in there to survive. They didn't know how long they would be in there, but they, were, they figured they were safe inside the building. It took about 17 minutes for the U.S. Air Force Security Police to arrive on scene. Now there's another confrontation. The two U.S. Air Force Security Police personnel armed, exited their patrol vehicle, and confronted the saucer. It was parked right there. Although the two SPs did not have any contact with the technicians at this point, because remember, the technicians were locked inside the building, they did examine the saucer. Again, the two entities were around. The, the two police, uh, policemen couldn't see any entities. They just saw this ramp that's down on the ground and this big saucer sitting on some tripods. So the security police personnel thought they would examine the craft to see maybe these entities were inside. Interviewing them later, one of the senior security police uh, person thought that this might have been some sort of an Air Force craft that was secret. A short time later, the two technicians exited the building and informed the SPs of what happened. And they pointed to the rear of the building saying, that the two entities are back here, behind, behind the building. At this time, a second U.S. Air Force security patrol arrived. This time, there was a security policeman with his working dog, or a patrol dog. The patrol dog immediately ran to the rear of the building, ran away from his handler to the rear of the building and began to bark. The dog handler ran behind the building after his dog. The patrol dog and his handler confronted the two entities. They were standing behind this building. Verbal commands were given by the security policemen, but the commands were not obeyed. It appeared that these two entities couldn't understand anything in English, and they didn't respond in any other language. 
they were in front of the two, of the security policeman, the dog handler with his dog, but they didn't understand what the security policeman's commands were. The entities continued to move towards the saucer. The patrol dog then attacked one of the entities, tearing the sleeve of the entity's uniform or outfit. Unbeknownst to the SPs, another entity exited the craft. Now, no one knew that there was another one entity inside the craft. The two SPs that initially responded to the scene did walk up the ramp and look in, but thought maybe this was some kind of experimental Air Force craft and decided not go any farther. As, a, as the entity was attacked, he pointed something at the dog, which caused the dog to immediately run away. Not harming the dog, not shooting the dog with any uh, kind of uh, explosive device or bullet, but it scared the dog. Both entities carried the injured entity back to the craft. So the one that got out of the craft came back to where the other two were. The attack on the one entity seemed to injure him and, a lot, and he was on the ground. But the other two entities picked him up and carried him back to the craft. One of the SPs pulled out his 38 caliber revolver and fired several rounds at the entities. I don't know if that was such a good idea, but it, it, placing yourself in such a situation that you, ha you had virtually unknown entities uh, attacking you or uh, being in your presence, uh, I think maybe uh, they considered it a hostile act because they chased the dog away and they didn't know what this device was that one of the entities was carrying. So the one uh, policeman fired the bullet, fired his gun at the uh, one entity. The bullet seemed to stun one of the entities who then fell to the ground. Now we have two injured entities. Additional SPs and two U.S. Army military policemen from nearby Fort Lewis uh, arrived on scene. They just happened to be in a patrol area and they, ha and they heard their call for assistance and they arrived. Eventually the entities were able to pull their injured comrades back into the craft. But the craft did not immediately fly away. It remained on the ground. It was surmised that the entities were trying to maybe provide first aid to their injured comrades. A U.S. Air Force Security Police Supervisor arrived on scene and ordered the guards to disable the craft in some way. Now, no one knew where this craft came from. No one knew exactly what this craft was made of. Two entities that appeared non-human. Um, so how were they gonna disable this craft? They tried a number of things by shooting an M16 rifle into the bottom portion of the craft. Now remember, the, the bottom portion of the craft was still open. They even tried to fire rounds into that area. <clears throat> Eventually, a beam of light was directed out of the side of the craft, striking one of the Army MPs. He fell to the ground. The other MPs and security policemen quickly moved away from the craft. Now we got an injured soldier. They pulled him away. When they pulled him away, the others retreated some distance, safe distance away. The craft then flew away towards the west. Two F-106 fighter jets from the 318th Fighter Interceptor Squadron on base flew in an intercept mission towards the craft that was flying away. However, this UFO or flying saucer was able to outfly the two F-106 jets. Eventually, the AFOSI arrived on scene and began a detailed investigation of the incident. The incident was classified top secret and remained in the OSI files unsolved. Eventually, this incident was moved into a training manual for OSI agents. Now, when the OSI agents arrived on scene, what did they do? They immediately started an investigation. They started to collect evidence. 
The injured military policeman was transported by ambulance to Madigan Army Hospital, which was just a short distance away. He was examined and found some burns on his left arm and left side, near the lower part of his rib cage. Doctors examined these wounds, but couldn't determine how they were formed. What happened? What ray gun, or uh, as they mentioned, one of the doctors mentioned to OS agents, or what kind of maybe laser was pointed at these at this particular MP that disabled him. Speaking with this MP later, he said he was disabled, his whole body felt numb and he fell to the ground, he couldn't move. But it was only short lived. He said after a few minutes he was able to get back up again. But then he noticed that his uniform was burnt and then he noticed that his skin was burning both on his left arm and just under his ribcage. The military working dog that was stunned was also examined by veterinarians, military veterinarians, who found these same style burn marks on the dog in two different places. What caused that? We never found out. What happened to this craft after it left? It flew west flew up towards Olympia National Forest in northwestern Washington. The F-106s pursued it. Now, these 106s had Falcon rockets that they could fire to disable this flying saucer. But the flying saucer outflew the F-106s. At the time, in 1972, these F-106s were advanced flight fighter jets. We didn't have F-16s or F-15s back in those days. These were probably one of the most advanced fighter jets, fighter interceptor jets that the Air Force had in the inventory. They were on alert 24 hours a day, 365 days a year at McCord. And two of them always carried nuclear weapons called Genies. So these jets were fast, but they could never catch up to this flying saucer. Some reports say that the flying saucer landed in the ocean off Vancouver Island. This was reported to us. This was contained in the OSI reports. And some reports claimed it gained altitude and flew out into the atmosphere. What was this flying saucer? Where did it come from? And why was it interested in the TACAN facility, the Tactical Air Navigation System, or the radio repeater system for the base? Was it something they had never seen before? Or maybe they encountered the TACAN signals and wanted to know where they were originating from? Some of the scientists surmised that happened. That this signal that the TACAN was sending out, they were homing in on. And they wanted to know where this came from. Why they landed where, where they, when they did, in, in plain sight of Air Force personnel, we just couldn't figure that out. But it was a strange incident, it happened. Fortunately, nobody was killed, but it's maintained in the annals of UFO history, maintained by the Air Force Office of Special Investigation.